It's my pleasure now to invite the European Commissioner for Economy and former Prime Minister of Italy, Mr. Paolo Gentiloni, to the stage for his, his remarks. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Calispera, great pleasure to be here today and thank you for, for the invitation. Let me uh, start with Heraclitus and the notion of Pantare. This idea that no man ever steps in the same river because it is not the same river and he is not the same man. In that vein, I believe we can say that today Greece is not the same country that it has been 10 years or even five years ago. And the same is for Europe, profoundly changing in this period. For Greece, this is the story of an extraordinary bound made possible after very difficult times by the determination of the Greek people and of its successive governments. And I'm very proud to have been a small, very small part of that story by putting an end to the enhanced surveillance of Greece in 2022, the end of the so-called Memoranda era. And last year, Greece regained investment grade status and since the pandemic, as Matthias was uh, recalling us, economic growth has been well above the EU average in Greece. The end of enhanced surveillance for Greece also marked the symbolic conclusion of a very challenging period in the history of the Euro. I think we learned the lesson of the previous crisis. We took bold new common measures to protect workers and kickstart the recovery, first with SURE, then with Next Generation EU, and we financed them for the first time with large-scale emission of EU debt. And Greece is one of the main beneficiaries of this support. At its peak in 2020, the SURE program supported more than 40% of Greek workers and saved an estimated 200,000 jobs. Greek recovery and resilience plan is worth, as you know, 36 billion euros. That is about 17% of GDP. More than any other EU country and roughly double of the sides of the post-war Marshall Plan. That same unity and solidarity that we had after the pandemic was on display when we faced the economic fallout of Russia's aggression in Ukraine. I think the EU has weathered the economic consequences of this uh, second black swan better than maybe many had predicted. At the end, we can say we have managed to largely decouple from Russian gas. We avoided a recession at EU level. Inflation is progressively falling back towards the ECB target and employment is at its highest level in more than a decade. Still, we know that these shocks have taken their toll. Growth, in 20, growth is not everything, as the, the Slovenian president reminded us, but it is something. So in 23, growth came in at just 0.4% and turned negative in 23 in 11 European countries, including some of the larger European economies. Our latest economist forecasts expect growth to pick up moderately in the second half of this year and to accelerate somewhat next year. Even though we are talking about relatively modest figures, 0.8% growth in 
this year and 1.5 next year for the euro area. And Greece is one of the brighter spots in this European picture. Our latest forecast foresees growth of 2.3% for both this year and 2025. And beyond that, we need to ask to the Delphi Oracle, probably, because we don't have solid uh, forecast. Still, as we look ahead, the challenges for the European economy are becoming clear. An economic slowdown with question marks hanging over the Europe's competitiveness amid broader geopolitical turmoil. So in this context, making full use of the tools we have, starting with next generation EU, must be our top priority. For Greece, our estimates indicate that the full implementation of the Recovery and Resilience Plan could provide an extra boost of up to 4.4% to its GDP by 2026. You know, economic models are always controversial, but this is something very important. Today, Greece is among the group of member states leading the way in the implementation of the recovery plan. It has already received more than 40% of the funds, and keeping up the good pace we have seen so far, also in the coming years, will be crucial. And moving forward, the challenge is also to conduct prudent fiscal policy and return to prudent deficit while maintaining sustained and robust economic growth, which in turn accelerates debt reduction. So a difficult balance, or as we say, a narrow path. And I'm convinced that the reform of our fiscal rules creates a more favorable context in this regard. We are moving from a pact which was mainly a stability pact to a pact which is potentially a stability and growth pact. In this framework, preserving higher level of investments at national level is certainly important. The EU public investment ratio has been steadily rising in the wake of the pandemic and is expected to reach 3.5% of GDP up from 3% in 2019. This means a stark contrast with what happened after the financial crisis, when public investment declined and declined and declined, year after year, in the Euro area and in Europe. In this case, the level of public investment is now higher than before the pandemic. But as we look ahead, it is clear that the economic and geopolitical challenges we face, the green and digital transition, the industrial competitiveness, the defense capabilities, all this require us to mobilize investments on an unprecedented scale. On defense, for instance. Defense, but also green and digital transition, the magnitude of these challenges is simply too big for any single country to tackle by itself. That is why we must think and act European. And next generation EU has shown out how it can be done. And this program expiring in 2026, now is the time to think about what come next after next generation EU. It was a, and it is a winning formula, which we cannot simply file away in the archives, the formula of next generation EU. I believe that new common funding for our common priorities should be part of the solution. In parallel, we need to become better at mobilizing private investment, and one of the keys is to develop truly European capital markets, because our companies will not wait for us. Our companies will also not wait if we don't tackle the cost of energy. Energy prices today are much lower than their peak one and a half year ago, but our industry continues to pay on average three times as much for electricity as in the US. The solution, the only solution 
it is very controversial, but the only solution is to continue with the green transition, not to roll it back, as some are suggesting, in my view. We should be pragmatic, we can adapt things, but the direction of travel is the green transition, if we want to address the challenges of energy cost. And finally, the EU needs also to strengthen its role in the world in a context of rising geopolitical tensions and challenges to our multilateral trade system. I, I, I heard the, the, the voice of the shipping industry and how this industry is now threatened also by geopolitical dangers, for example, in the Red Sea. So this is also uh, something pushing our uh, global role, in my view. One of the success of the last few years uh, was on a multi-dimension multi um, um, scale, the agreement on corporate taxation. The OECD, who is here, was fundamental. And I'm proud we, we reached the EU unanimity, which is never easy, to support the minimum taxation. And I'm very happy that just this week, Greece has passed a law to make this a reality here in Greece. When it comes to trade, we should work to make globalization safer, but as Matthias just said, to keep globalization going. We, I think, protectionism will not solve any of our problems. So making globalization more secure, more safe, maybe supply chains shorter, but this is not at all uh, meaning we are interrupting globalization. It is for sure we should pay closer attention to our neighborhood and strengthen economic ties in the region, especially in the Balkans and in the Mediterranean. And geography is destiny. So countries like Greece are ideally well-placed to lead, to have a leading role in this sense. In conclusion, the crisis of the last few years and the geopolitical realities of today have shaken the foundations on which recently Europe have built its economic success. Namely, that Europe could continue to rely on Russia for cheap gas, on Asia or maybe China, on the continuous increase of uh, trade, and on the US for security. It is a whole business model and even a mindset that has to change. I think that over the course of this mandate, the change has started to happen. We have seen it in the way we tackled the crisis. We have seen it in the historical decision to open negotiation with Ukraine and Moldova and to accelerate, as the president of Montenegro reminded us, negotiation with other candidate countries. And we have seen it in the way Greece has regained its rightful place at the core of our union, and it is now one of the protagonists of the great transition. I think we have to keep that same level of ambition, that same readiness to break new ground as we look to the months and years ahead. And the next European elections are an opportunity to have a frank debate about the future of our economy, the security of our continent, and let's make it count. Let's make the European election count. Thank you.